Thank you so much. Big welcome to everybody in Cambridge, Leicester, in Peterborough. Let's give a big welcome to Cafe Church. Great to have you joining us too. Um, I don't know about you, but I'm really excited about what God's already doing in our midst. We're very much in alpha season. Isn't it great to know that in Kingsgate, Peterborough, we have around 120 young people on a youth alpha? Isn't that amazing? And then I'm very expectant about the launch of the adult uh, uh, parties coming up to do with Alpha in Cambridge, Leicester and here in Peterborough. Uh, this afternoon I'm going down to speak to our Kingsgate London congregation in Finsbury Park, so please pray for that. Now, I know that Christmas seems a long way away, somewhere in the dim distant past, but I've been recently enjoying one of the presents I was given, which is an infographic Bible. One of the things that struck me, I was flipping through and I came to a diagram that talked about the top four things that Jesus taught on. How many know if Jesus teaches on something a lot, it really matters? You might not be surprised to know that two of those top things, one was he taught a lot about the kingdom of God, he taught an awful lot about his father God, but the next two may surprise you. He also taught a lot on faith and he also taught a lot on money. And so I was thinking about that. Why then do faith and money get in Jesus' top four things that are really, really important for us to know? Well, when it comes to faith, by now I hope you begin to realise why faith is so important. Hebrews 11.6 says this, Without faith it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So let's follow this through. Obviously, uh, relationship with our Father is important, but the number one way that we relate to our Father is through faith. Hence, it's really, really important. So why then does money reach the top four? Well, because money is very often described as like a number one rival to our love for God. And so Jesus teaches in that because he doesn't want us to be bound by a love of money. He wants us to be free to relate to God and to be blessed in our finances. Can I have an amen? amen. So he teaches a whole lot about that. And so what I'm going to do today is I'm going to combine these two really important topics, faith and finances. And so the very sophisticated title for my message is this, Faith for Finances. <laughs> okay, so what we're going to do is I want to help, and I'm really expectant that this is going to help you whether right now your finances are in complete disarray, or maybe not in disarray, but you just know there's things out of order and out of control. Or it may be that actually it's not so much disorder but it's just really tight and you've not really got any margin. Or it may even be that you're doing really well. How many you know there's always more when it comes to God's word and God's blessing over our lives? So what I want to do, I want to apply the five basic principles of faith that we looked at a couple of weeks ago, and I want to apply them into this specific area of our finances. And you're You'll, you'll be pleased to know that all through the next three days of our prayer and fasting, we're going to be praying over these five principles. So maybe we could say these five things again by way of remembering them. Let's say this together. Ha hear it, know it, say it, do it, wait for it. The only change that I'm going to do today is because these are not a formula, they're principles, I'm going to flip the order because it's such a practical area of our lives to make sense of this, the do it has to come before the say it when we're talking about our finances. So first thing, let's get ready to go. First principle of how to grow in faith is we've got to hear it. Let me remind you, faith is not something we work up, faith is something that comes to us. Romans 10, 17 says, so then faith comes by hearing, hearing and hearing by the word. word of God. Some translations of Romans 10, 17 pick up on this whole idea of the context of Romans 10, which is preaching. So they replace the word, uh, the word, word there with message. Faith comes by hearing the message. I remember very early in my Christian life, um, I was sitting in a meeting it was a really small meeting because I remember it was in a home. And there was a guy preaching a great message on the exchange of the cross. 
The idea that Jesus bore a whole bunch of negative stuff in order that we might enjoy the blessing of God. And so he went for things like, Jesus became sin that we might be made the righteousness of God. Can you say I'm to that? He continued. And he, then he started broadening it out into areas I was less familiar with. So he started saying, Jesus was made a curse that in him we might be blessed. And I'm thinking, okay. And then he said something that rocked my boat. He says, Jesus bore our poverty that we might enjoy his prosperity. And at that moment, I thought, now th this is, cannot be right. In fact, I remember muttering on the inside saying, that preacher's got a problem. <laughs> Hope you're not saying that right now. <laughs> and as soon as I sort of muttered it under my breath, I sensed the, the, the still small voice on the inside that I'd begin to uh, discern was the Holy Spirit say, no, Dave, you've got a problem. <laughs> Me? I've got the problem. And basically, this was my problem. You see, I'd grown up in a secure, stable home and never really worried and never really had massive lack. But we were in a scenario. We lived on a Christian community for a time. My dad was a vicar. And so money was really tight. And so we never had much. And also, I think maybe something to do with the religious background. There was, there was somewhere in there this idea that in certain cases, poverty was a good thing, a virtue. And so what the Holy Spirit was wanting to put his finger on was that I had a problem. I had a little bit of a poverty mentality. And so as soon as this guy starts talking about um, prosperity, I'm like, that, that is wrong. And I thought, well, I don't want to be imbalanced in this. Lord, what are you saying? And so how does faith come? Faith comes by hearing. So I thought, well, we've got the word of God. I've had that little rhema. I want to go and check out the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. I want to find out what does the Bible say about this? If I'm wrong, but I'm reacting to something, what's the biblical truth here? And so over the next 10 hours, I'm going to show you the results of my studies. No, I'm going to try and summarize it in one little picture because I, this, this really kind of helped me. I felt what came to mind was a picture and I've shared this before, of like a highway with two ditches. And I felt the Holy Spirit saying that to me and to all God's people, he wants to help us stay out of or get out of a ditch of poverty or a fear of lack. How many, how many want to be out of that ditch? But secondly, without going the other end and falling into an opposite ditch, a ditch of materialistic prosperity, where prosperity teaching can be manipulated and we end up just as covetous and greedy as bound as those who are not people of faith. So I felt the Lord saying, it's not a poverty gospel, it's not a materialistic prosperity gospel, but what it is, it's a highway of a provision gospel. You and I can enjoy God's provision for our lives. And the, the scripture that kind of summarized all my studies is, is one of my favorite in the Bible. Um, it's one of my go-to scriptures on this. Matthew 6, verse 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. See, the seek first his kingdom, his righteousness, means I'm not going to make money my God. I'm not going to go into materialism. It's going to keep me out of the ditch of materialistic prosperity. But the, all these things will be added to you, frees me from worry and a fear of lack, knowing that I've got a heavenly father who wants to provide for me. And he wants to provide for you too. Amen. So that, that's kind of 35 years of teaching in one diagram. But, but seriously, there's something that comes. You see, the, the, the confusion and the unbelief and the mix-up in my mind got clear because I heard the word of God. That's the first thing. Faith comes by hearing. Second principle of faith, we've got to hear it. And secondly, what do we want to do? We've got to know it. You see, from hearing the word, we get this inner confidence, this inner assurance in our hearts that we call faith. Let me remind you, Hebrews 11.1 1 says, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. I mean, we, we, we can't see the God we're talking about right now who loves us and cares for us, but we have an inner confidence and assurance that he is good and that he's out for our well-being and he wants to help us become a blessing to others. How do we know that? Because the word says, and we get this inner knowing. And when you know that you know that you know that God is good, 
See, I knew when I first got saved, good, God was good in the spiritual area of my life. I just didn't know he was interested or bothered about any other area. But when you hear the word on it, you realize that God is interested in every area of our lives and he wants to free us and help us in all these areas. So what I have put together today, and I thought, how can I kind of, in, in, in such a short space of time, give you just a, a kind of like an overview? And so what I've done is I've put down and I'm going to read them out to you, 12 biblical convictions concerning faith for finances. 12 biblical convictions. What I've done, um, I put them, they're going to be on, on the web near, near the talk on, where you can download the media messages. There are also those of you who are tracking on version. And what I'd love to do is I'd love you to take some time out, preferably this afternoon, and literally go through the, this list that I'm going to read, look up the scriptures, and get faith for yourselves. Because how many know, when you get it in here, it changes everything. Write them down, you know, make them personal. But here's my 12 biblical convictions. You're allowed to say amen or get excited on some of these. Firstly, God is our creator, and he created everything good. God the Father is our generous provider. God is the ultimate giver. He gave us his best in Christ. That's worth a big amen. amen. Through Christ, we can be content in every circumstance. God is the owner of everything. We are his stewards. The first fruit and the tithe, that's a tenth, belong to the Lord. As we first bring the tithe into the storehouse, the windows of heavens are opened and the devourer is rebuked. As New Testament believers, we're called to live grateful lives imitating the generosity of Jesus. As we give generously, God is glorified, lives are transformed and we get resupplied. Generous giving helps break the grip of materialism. We will be eternally rewarded for what we've invested. Here's the final one. You can love this. This summarizes it all. God wants to bless us to make us a blessing. Now, these 12 convictions, they're, they're true from the word of God. And, but God wants them to be true for you. Faith comes by hearing Faith comes as we know it on the inside. And I came to the point where I was not only utterly convinced that God wanted to provide for me, get me out of that poverty ditch, but he wanted to do more than that. He wanted to help me steward all that he'd given me, could it all come from him? And he wanted me not just to look to my needs, but to somehow walk in a way that I had enough to, to give generously. These are my three convictions. Live contentedly, steward wisely, and give generously. I hope that's a great foundation. But if we're going to see the blessed to be a blessing life, the generous life, the free life, actually become reality, this kind of faith is something that needs to be translated to action. So we've got to hear it, we've got to know it, but then thirdly, we've got to do it. There's things we need to do. See, uh, remind you, James 2.17 says, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. So what I want to do is I want to use an illustration. And you should see me behind, behind me on the screen, um, 10 notes, okay? So these 10 notes represent our income. Now, if you're in a, 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 you know, a season where you're really blessed, that might be a lot. Some of you, may that, that may be really small. But imagine we've all got 10 notes. Now, how many of you, when you were a child, um, you owned a piggy bank? Anyone own a piggy bank? Any got children who own, own a piggy bank? Anyone don't know what I'm talking about with a piggy bank? <laughs> we'll pray for you afterwards. You've missed out on life. But rather than just thinking about one piggy bank... I want to do an illustration around not just one, but four different piggy banks representing the four different accounts that we can spend what God has entrusted us with. And you'll notice the order, and this is the natural order. Uh, normally, we start out with, without faith, 
Notice what the first one is, it's spend. Isn't, isn't that what we know? Natural thought, isn't it? Without, without knowing the word, without faith, our natural tendency is to spend. So let's talk about that then. Here's how we come in if you're not yet a Christian or if we're in the early stage of our Christian life. There's a tendency, because money has such a pull, it's a rival to God, that our natural tendency is to think, it's my money. <laughs> No, the Bible says it's God's money, but that's our thought. We think it's my money, therefore it's up to me what I do and the natural pull of our flesh and the natural bombardment of the culture. Would you agree? Is that the more stuff you have, the more toys you have, the happier you are. And of course, it's based on a fundamental lie that, you know, stuff is good, but stuff doesn't satisfy us. Only God and his walking his way can ultimately satisfy us. But anyway, yeah, amen. But what we do is we start spending. And the problem is, is because of our needs and our wants all mixed up and the pull of the culture, we start basically spending the lot. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. But how do you know that sometimes ten isn't enough? So what do we do? We go to the bank and we start borrowing some more little red ones. How many know red ones, not good? What do they represent? Debt. Now, temporarily it may help you. It may help you get the extra that you think you need, et cetera. It may help you in a crisis. The problem with the, the red ones is that they don't belong to you. You're probably going to have to pay them back at interest. And, and if you're not careful, you can just get further and further and further in debt. How many know, I'm not just talking theoretically, this is a real issue. When we were doing the well-being series, we found out that, you know, culturally, in, in, in the nation, people's number one thing that's causing them stress and pressure is actually in the area of financial lack of peace and well-being. So this is really important. How many like to do things a different way? I mean, like a restart. You say, well, that's where I'm at. Or, you know, that's somewhere where I'm at. I don't want to live that way. God has a better plan for yours and my life. He wants us to operate by faith, not just by the natural way of doing things. So, so what's the, 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 the better way then? Well, the better way is to step back and actually say that God has a different order. So rather than spending being first, actually we need to change the order and we see that tithing in God's mind comes first and so rather than a spend probably not have any money for saving and hardly ever likely to tithe or give to charity now if we change the order first things first we have a different order can we read this order tithe save spend and give if you forget everything else about this message if you have that kind of order, this is going to massively help you because God knows better than we do. That deserved an amen from Cambridge and Leicester and Peterborough and Catholic Church. God knows better than we do. So here's, here's God's order. The first thing we do is by faith, because it is an act of faith, it was the first time you've done it, is to say, Lord, I, I, I believe, I, I, I trust you. Your word says you're first, so here goes. I'm going to do what your word says. I'm going to give you the first and the best, 10% of everything that comes in. I'm going to tithe. And God knows that it can be tough. Hence, in Malachi 3, says we've got to test him in this area. And why do we do that? Well, first and foremost, we do it because God is God and it's a way of worshipping and knowledge that everything comes from him. But also, and I said this last time in the well-being th thing, tithing is actually for your good as well as for God's glory. Because here's what happens. And this is the faith part. Faith says that when I tithe, the 90% get blessed. Amen? Something different. And here, here, here's, here's the test. Am I prepared to believe God's word, because that's the only evidence I have when I start out, that I'm going to be better off with a blessed 90% with God helping me than I'm trying to make it my way with my 100%. And that's the, that's, the, that's the starting point. It's a beautiful starting point when it comes to practically putting to action our faith for finances. That's the first priority. But that's not the end story. In fact, that's just the beginning. So this is where we need to get a holistic view of finances. Some people just teach on tithing and just do that. 
And then they wonder why not everything's working because God is as interested in what we do with the whole 100% as he is just what we do with the 10%. Because who, who owns the lot? He does, and he expects us to be stewards of everything. So it really matters then that we get God's wisdom and follow God's word and obey just natural principles, to be honest, that will ha- help you actually be blessed to be a blessing. So then, here's the, the, the next priority after tithing. Even if you can only do a little, and this may be, I don't know how I'm going to do this, but even a little, I would strongly encourage you just to put a little bit aside to start saving. Why do you need to save? Well, if you, particularly if you've been in debt, you need to start being, being able to deal with that indebted thing. How many know that sometimes you don't intentionally get in debt? Things happen. Have you noticed stuff happens? I, I, I'm looking forward to the new heavens and the new earth. Anyone else? <laughs> Where everything's fixed, nothing breaks, <laughs> no, nothing un, unexpected happens, but we're not in that yet, are we? We're in this world and stuff happens, stuff breaks, emergencies come, crises come. If we've not even got a tiny bit of savings, a tiny bit of an emergency fund, unintentionally we're going to go into debt and if we're not careful we're going to get further into debt. So even just start with a little bit to put away some savings in an emergency fund and, and this, here's what happens, you must do these simultaneously. Because what starts happening, as you start tithing, God starts blessing you. As you start saving, you start getting um, some, some buffer And then here's the third area we need to attend to, which is our spending. Now, the reality is, particularly if you're starting out on this, you think, well, surely then all the rest has got to go into that spending bucket. So let's put all the rest in, 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 everything else goes into spending. It's all gone. Now, anything wrong with that? Well, how many would agree it's better to be out of debt, tithing with a bit of a buffer and, and, and your needs being met How many think that's way better than the first diagram we showed you? So we're, we're, on, we're on a good journey. We're making progress here. But can I tell you, this is not God's ultimate for us as God's people. There is more beyond that. Because the problem is, we can be like that, stable, but we have absolutely no margin for what? Well, maybe we need to save a bit more. What about giving? We've got nothing in the giving pot And what about, say, for future things? You know, you've got a special occasion coming in the future. You, you can't do that because literally everything's taken. So can I encourage you a few things? First is obviously watch impulse spending. You know, if you can go on a course or get some help to help get a real systematic plan to get your spe- spending in order. I just thought about something as I was praying the week. I thought, why not just go through your bank statement and under every item, just put a W or an N. The N stands for needs, the W stands for wants. And be pretty brutal with yourself. Coffee at Starbucks three times a day, N. No, no, that's a, that's a W. <laughs> Subscription to, no, no, that, that may be nice to have him. There's nothing wrong with having it, but if you can't afford it, so, so be radical. And just see if you just can't start getting some stuff That while you're in the current season, you've only got that amount, that your income may increase, but while you're in that season, be radical and make a distinction and draw a line so that, and here's the beauty of where we're heading, you can get some margin. Everybody say margin. margin. It's a beautiful thing. You know, we've not always had margin in our lives. We've had to work hard on some of these principles where you can get some margin. So, so what, what do you do with the margin? Well, Let, let's, that, that, when you start doing this, you, you can get some out. We can start using some extra. Now, it could go in one or two ways. You could do a little bit more into saving. But also, it means that we start getting into the blessed to be a blessing where we can actually start putting money into giving. You say, well, why, why, why would I want to do that? I've already tithed. Can I say that in the New Testament... We live in a better covenant with better promises. I believe that we should be freed and blessed to be a blessing, not to just give the tithe, but to give more than the tithe, to give generously, to fund the gospel, to meet the needs of the poor. We, and now here's the thing. We don't give to get. Some people teach this. They say you give to get. Put in a fiver to this ministry and by sundown, you know, you're going to have 500 quid. How many think that's a bit... But 
The promise is, if we give with right motives, I love you, Lord. I want to I wanna bless you. And, and I, I love something more important than an extra bit of stuff. I love people. And if what I can do can help people's lives now and fund the gospel so that they can be there for eternity, that's an investment worth doing. Amen. That's, you know, and I'm talking to a generous church. We do that every year. Stunningly, people give. Some of us monthly and you know, many of you just in, that, in our special offer, it's incredible what we're doing. We're investing ahead so that in eternity, we're not going to say, oh, I, you know, I, I slightly ratcheted down on the, on, on the car model that, 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 that I got. And, and that meant that gave me some margin so I could give so that somebody could get eternally saved. Can I eternity? We won't be thinking, I wish I had a better car. Isn't that right? Get an eternal perspective. Nothing wrong with nice cars, but it's about balance. It's about priorities here. And here's the thing. Just like there's a blessing on tithing and there's a natural blessing of order when we start saving, here's what happens when we start giving. There are tons of promises all through the New Testament. And while I said it again, we don't give to get. There are promises that when we give, not only is God glorified and other people's lives transformed, but we get resupplied. Listen to this. This is Paul talking in one of his key New Testament letters, 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 6. Remember this, this is in the context of giving, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And here's the promise. And God is able to bless you, what? Abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Blessed to be a blessing. And if we didn't get it, verse 11 makes it clear. You'll be made enriched in every way. If we stop there, we might end up in a materialistic prosperity ditch. But he says, what's the purpose of being enriched in every way? So that you can be generous on every occasion. And can I say, getting to the point where you have margin, where your finances in order, where you can give both planned giving into special offerings, compassion children, helping people in need, I want to tell you, it gets real, real fun. Because you know what Jesus teaches? It's more blessed to give than it is to receive. And when we're in kingdom order like this, when we, when we learn to do it, this kind of order, we, we, we first tithe, we, we, we start saving, we reign in our spending and we start giving, uh, the, the, the promise that, uh, of God to, 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 uh, to Abraham right back in Genesis 12, we, you and I will get to a point where we can say we've been blessed to be a blessing. Amen. And I share that picture because my faith is that if you'll start doing this message, I've got a couple more points to whiz through, but I want to tell you by the end of this year, and if we're still doing this in 10 years time, I want to tell you all across this house and many, many more people who've joined us, we're going to live in a level of blessing. We're going to be able to fund the gospel like never before. Windows of heaven are going to open like never before. The vow is going to be rebuked. Amen. Business is going to be blessed. Because God is a good God. Amen. Hear it, know it, do it. In one sense, that, that's the heart of the message. But the two final things, let me just finish off here. When we're doing it like this, when we're confident like this, number four, we can say it. Say what? Have you noticed that in all areas of faith, and maybe particularly in this era of finances, you may be doing it, but there's still a battle going on in your mind. Anyone notice that? Sometimes the enemy comes, sometimes fear comes, worry comes. You've sown a seed, you're waiting. And here's where the power of our words have incredible influence over our lives and our believer over the situations we're praying for. Mark 11:23 says, Truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. So the question is, what are we to say when it comes to our finances? 
Right in the heart of the Lord's Prayer, Jesus tells us what to say. Can I remind you? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. We're honoring him first. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. That's his kingdom first. But then right in the Lord's Prayer, Matthew 6 verse 11, this is what we're to say. Give us this day our daily bread. Can I ask you a question? When was the last time you prayed that prayer? I'm not talking about just praying it by rote. I'm talking about praying it specifically to a father who knows your needs and wants to provide for you. See, yes, we've got to do it, but I believe we release our faith and I believe many miracles are gonna come as we activate our faith and we start praying in faith. You say, how do you know that? Because again, right back in the beginning of our married life, and I've shared this before, we were absolutely, everything was super, super tight and we were doing it. <laughs> we weren't so good on the saving, but we were tithes and offerings, we were stepping out, we were, we were giving and we would write down all, all that we were giving and then specifically, say specifically, <laughs> we would write specific answers to prayer and time and time again for a period of about nine years, we saw God supernaturally answer the requests we made or even more than. Why? Because he's a good God. If Jesus said we are to pray, give us this day our daily bread, that's part of our privilege as the children of God. Let's go. If you have financial needs, pray about it. Amen. And then as you do, take some of these convictions, take some of these faith scriptures. I remember we would write down and we would declare day after day while, while we were still waiting for the answer. And my God will supply all of our needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Take these promises, write them down, speak them out of your mouth. If the devil comes to try and lie to you, say, but the word of God says. And then what gets really, really fun is when you start praying for your own needs, you can then start praying for other people's needs. I'm sure we're all around us. We are the family of God, aren't we? And he's not just my father, he's our father. We love to pray for other people's needs. I know Carol particularly just is regularly, she's got a list of people she's praying for, loves to see other people's needs get met because God is a generous and a loving heavenly father. Amen? So we've got to say, yeah, we've got to say it. And then finally... We've got to wait for it. Hebrews 6 verse 12 said that it's through faith and patience that we wait for the promises of God, that we inherit the promises of God. This is especially relevant when it comes to finances. Some of you may have heard and maybe there's people around, maybe for yourself, when somebody starts out maybe tithing, sometimes they get an, almost an immediate miracle. How many want more immediate miracles all around this place? We want more. Or they, they, somebody sows into an offering sacrificially and suddenly they get an amazing pay rise or a business deal. God does that and he can do that. But I think when it comes to finances, we need to recognize normally there is a time lag between when you start doing and when the harvest comes. See, Paul was in an agrarian culture and he understood these principles. You sow in one season and you reap in other. I said a couple of weeks ago, we're in an instant culture, aren't we? We get frustrated by waiting seconds, let alone months, for something to come to pass. I mean, so if you, you imagine, you know, if I mean, we have some farmers and people in agriculture out there, you know, if you're sowing a, a field of potatoes, the farmer doesn't go out, sow some potatoes, and then next morning, come up, see nothing on the surface, and throws a paddy, do you? Where are my potatoes? <laughs> no, the farmer knows, doesn't he? There's a something's going on. It's going on, on the ground. You can't see it, but it's going to happen. And I think that, that we need to recognize that there are natural principles of waiting, and there are spiritual principles of harvesting. Naturally, if you start getting out of debt, you start saving, it won't necessarily next month always immediately turn around. It may, depending on how far down you are, it may take a while, but keep going, saying no to amazon.com time and time again, yeah? Each time you say no, maybe deliberately you want to put it in a savings account or put it in side for some giving, just little by little, little by little, you will start seeing a turnaround. 
That's naturally. But thank God we're not just people who obey natural principles. We have God our Father who has promised to supernaturally multiply and bless us if we're living in his order. And so there's a beautiful little scripture that I want to close with. Galatians chapter uh, 6. Paul is talking about financial giving and financial support. And then he says in verse 7, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. And here's what we need to know. God sees everything we do all of the time. That's not, oh no. That means every good act you do, he sees it. How many think God can see online giving as well as cash giving? He sees it all. He is watching. God, it, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. And then he goes on in verse nine. Let us therefore, this is, this is the, not become weary in doing good for at the proper time or some translations have in due season, we will reap a harvest. Let's say this together. If we do not give up. God is watching over his word to perform it. Here's my heart and my faith for all of us. If we will take these principles, start doing them, I believe we're going to start seeing some very quick turnarounds. In many cases, we're going to start seeing some amazing turnaround by the end of this year. But I want to almost sow this as faith for a decade. How blessed could we be to be a blessing in 10 years' time? Amen. Let's pray together. Father, I want to thank you for your word to us. I thank you that you are a good, good father. You're our generous provider. Everything we have comes from you. So Lord, we ask you to help us become better stewards, to become free from poverty and materialism, walk in your provision and learn to be generous and bless many other people. May many other people's lives be transformed for eternity as a result of us being doers of the word and not hearers only. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.